Okay. Um, yes, so hopefully you can see my screen. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak here. And thanks for coming to listen. Um, so yeah, most uh, almost everything I say will be uh, based on joint work with Kieran, who's uh, given the talk after me. But also uh, small parts are uh, uh, joint earlier work with Peter Mühlbacher, Bruno Nachtigalle, and uh, Daniel Ulchip. So um, the talk is in three parts, and the first part is about mirror models. And I'd like to um, start by sort of set the scene by uh, mentioning this uh, very classical problem uh, about mirror models. So in the Lorentz mirror model, you have um, the two-dimensional integer lattice. At each vertex, you have basically three options. There's no mirror. There's a north-west mirror or a north-east mirror. So the probability to have a mirror is P. These choices are made independently of each other. And given that you have a mirror, the orientation, sort of northwest or northeast, they are equally likely. And the question you ask is if, um, if there's a light source here at the origin, and the light sort of travels along the edges of the lattice and bounce perfectly off either side of the mirrors, um, does the light ray or the light rays, do they have a positive probability of reaching infinitely far? Or are they all trapped? I mean, here you can imagine there's a little ray of light which is trapped in this small little box. Or you could have a larger box consisting perhaps of these mirrors where the light is sort of prevented from going outside. So the question is, is there a positive probability for light to reach infinitely far? And so, um, I mean, clearly the case when p equals zero is uh, not very interesting. There are no mirrors anywhere. The light does reach infinitely far straight. Um, but also the case p equals one um, is uh, very non-trivial. So p equals one, there's still randomness because the orientations of all the mirrors are random. Um, but here it's known, sort of, it's a, it's a theorem which, I mean, in the literature it says that it was well known in the 70s, so it's not really attributed to, to anyone in particular. Um, the light is almost surely trapped, so there are no infinite rays of light. And this comes about due to, to a coupling with percolation, and I'll come back to this coupling uh, in a little while um, to say roughly why, why this is. But the conjecture is that for any positive p, so as soon as you have a non-zero density of mirrors, this should happen, that you indeed um, have no probability of light reaching infinitely far. Uh, there are not so many rigorous results on this particular problem. Um, there's one uh, fairly recent rigorous result, which is a lower bound of the probability of reaching uh, distance r. So this probability is at least one of two r plus one, meaning that if we if we think about the random variable x here, which is the maximum distance illuminated by a ray of light from the origin, well, the conjecture is that this random variable is almost surely finite. But this result says that whether this is true or not, it has infinite expectation. Because the expected value of this random variable, you can compute it by summing these probabilities, you get a divergent sum. So that's uh, this classical problem, which is still unsolved. I'm going to consider a, a variant of this, which I call a uh, weighted model. So um, to define this model, we need to work on a finite graph. So for simplicity, let's say we're on a torus. So 2L by 2L torus, you see I've drawn the left on the top here in, in a lighter color, and they're actually copies. So this mirror here is just a copy of that mirror. So it's a toroidal in both, or periodic in both, uh, both directions. And I have this uh, convenient um, sort of bookkeeping or, or coloring, which is every other face is black, every other face is white in the chessboard pattern. This, this works because we're on a, we have an even side length here, so there are no clashes. You can have alternating colors. 
So that's a, a book, bookkeeping device. You'll see perhaps on the next couple of slides why this is useful. Right, so that's the basic setting. What's what's our uh, our model? So we have weights associated with with the possibilities at each vertex. So there's a weight associated with northeast mirrors. There's a weight associated with northwest, and another one associated with absent mirrors. Uh, I want these two to be positive. This one could be zero. And what I kind of do now is that I um, consider all possible trajectories. So I imagine shining light anywhere in this lattice, looking at the trajectories, which because we're on a finite uh, graph, a finite torus, they'll all, all be loops. And it could look like this. And uh, now I've added a little bit of colors as well. So here's the whole collection of loops uh, formed by rays of light in this, uh, in this configuration. Right, so, so far I've only said what is the basic setup, what are the parameters, so we have these weights, and we have uh, another parameter, n, which is a number of colors, because I want to be able to assign uh, one out of n colors to all of the loops. So now let me tell you what is the probability distribution. So, well, um, let me first phrase it like this. So what I could do is I could look at joint configurations. And by joint configurations, I mean precise, precisely like in the picture, I keep the information about all the mirrors and all the colors. So I can think about this as a joint configuration of mirrors plus colored edges. Right? And so the weight, I want to assign this a weight, which is just given by a factor W sub N E for each northeast mirror, so raised to the power of the number of northeast, similarly for the northwest and absent mirrors. And then I have this uh, restriction here, I call it the indicator that is compatible. This is, which is basically exactly what I just said in the last bullet point here. When I assign the colors to the edges, each loop has a constant color. So compatible means that if two edges are in the same loop, then they share the same color. So that's one way of looking at it, if I keep all the information both about mirrors and the colors. But we could also integrate out or sum out um, the, the colors assigned to the loops and just look at what is the, the, the distribution on the mirrors, mirror configurations. And then, well, I have n choices per loop. So when I sum this, I get a factor n to the number of loops. Um, what I should have said, of course, is that these, I mean, I haven't made any assumptions about these weights other than being positive or non-negative. So this is just a weight. You have to normalize this uh, in order to get a probability distribution and, and the same here. So you divide by the sum of all those uh, numbers. So that's, that's the basic model. A um, couple of comments. If I uh, take n to be equal to 1, n was the number of colors here, um, and I take these weights to be the same, let's call them p over 2, and this one 1 minus p, well, I just recover the model that I started with, except, of course, for the fact that we're now on a finite torus, but, I mean, we have independent mirrors uh, like before. Um, but the case that I'm going to be concerned with here is um, large n. And to understand what happens when n is large, it's perhaps easiest to look at uh, this version, where we only keep the, the distribution on the mirrors. So n is large means that I favor configura com configurations where I have a lot of loops. Lots of small loops would be favored when n is large. So what we can do is to kind of look at, well, what happens if I let n go to infinity? So, I mean, we have these probability measures. They depend well, on all the parameters that I had on the previous slide, but importantly, they depend on n and l. So now I'm saying, I mean, the interesting limit would be to let l go to infinity first, because they're a large system. But to get an idea what we might expect, let's take 
n to infinity first with l fixed. L, remember, was the size of the torus here. So what happens if I let n go to infinity? This should give us some idea of what happens for large n when l goes to infinity. And um, it's not hard to see that you will just concentrate on the configurations with the maximum number of loops. So I can actually write this as one half, sort of a delta mass at W, I call it, and another half delta mass at B. By this, I mean exactly this configuration. So this is the, I mean, these two configurations are the two configurations of mirrors which maximize the number of loops. Right. The loop has to have length uh, four. It has to bounce four times in order to close. Here, all loops indeed have length exactly four. So these two configurations maximize the number of loops. And uh, also now you see why I did this uh, black and white coloring. You can easily tell them apart. In one of them, the loops are around white faces. and one of them, around black faces. That's why I had W and B over here. So that uh, gives some idea what we can kind of expect to see when n is large. But as I said, the more interesting question is what happens if um, we consider large systems? And so here's the sort of a background result or the starting point for our study, a previous work on this problem by Chase Priyatik and Stengel, 2000. So um, they consider symmetric case. So the weights associated with the northeast and the northwest mirrors are assumed to be equal here. And the result says as follows. Well, for n large enough, in the L goes to infinity limit, there are two distinct non-translation invariant Gibbs states. I call them mu w and mu b because they are dominated by loops surrounding white and black faces respectively. So, I mean, here I have sort of a, if you don't really know about Gibbs states, what this means is simply that when L is large, the typical configuration you see will be obtained by sort of um, first tossing a coin. So with probability one half, you get almost all Ws with a few Bs. This means we have a picture like this, but some defects. We have an infant system or a very large system after all, so there will be some deviations from this perfect pattern. But with probability one half, you'll see almost that picture. With probability one half, you'll see the other picture where the little loops around the black faces. So this is uh, this is what uh, Chase, Priyatko, and Stengel proved. Now, um, they, they needed this assumption of symmetry um, for their proof. Um, because it relies on sort of reflection symmetry. Well, you see, if you if you reflect a configuration like this, you map everything uh, across, then of course northeast and northwest mirrors sort of trade places. But if these two weights are the same, then um, the distribution doesn't change. And this is uh, sort of part of the. Uh, argument needed in the proof, but shouldn't really be needed uh, for the result, because if you think about it, as soon as these two weights are positive, then you have sort of a possibility of getting the mirrors of both orientations. And if n is really, really large, the, the main effect should be that you really want as many loops as possible. And then the fact that one of these uh, mirror weights is uh, larger than the other shouldn't really make a difference. But the, the proof requires the reflection symmetry. Um, another important point to note about the parameters in this result is that um, I haven't said anything about this weight associated with empty sites, so the weight for missing mirrors. Uh, there's no assumption on that. So you can have a, a high density on uh, missing mirrors if, if you like. But if you look at the special case where this parameter is equal to zero, so this is when you have no empty sites, there's mirrors everywhere, then uh, a stronger result is in fact available. Uh, I won't go into much details about it, but it's related to this thing that I hinted at before, uh, this thing about coupling with percolation. 
So I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, why this case is special, how it relates to percolation theory, and then focusing on the rest of the talk when this, uh, this weight is non-zero. That's our main interest. Okay, so one slide devoted to the case when you have no empty sites. So every site where there could be a mirror, there is a mirror, is just randomly oriented. And um, what we can do then is the following construction. So I colored the faces uh, black and white. Now I kind of use that a little bit more, this coloring. I say, well, the black faces, I draw a vertex. And I connect them if they're sort of uh, adjacent. Um, I mean, they share a corner, these two faces. You connect the corresponding blue vertices. This gives me a copy of the Z2 integer lattice. I mean, okay, perhaps if we're not Taurus, it's just a, a finite portion of it, but um, uh, you hopefully see what I mean. Um, so that's the solid ones um, with vertices centered on black faces. You can do the same with uh, the white faces, uh, draw in vertices there. You get another copy of Z2, which is, um, I mean, Z2 is uh, equal to its uh, planar dual. So you get um, Z2 and its dual, which is another copy of Z2. Of course, rotated 45 degrees, um, but that makes no difference. And so the rule now what I want, that I want to implement uh, is to say that, okay, each mirror here is either parallel to the solid edge, like in this case, or it's parallel to the dashed edge. And whichever one is par it's parallel to, that's the one I keep. And I delete the other one. So that's what I say here. I mean, bisected this dashed edge over here, the mirror cuts it across. So I delete that one and I keep the other one. Then uh, this gives a random percolation configuration. Uh, in fact, two of them, because we have the primal one and we have the dual one, where we keep the dual edge, if and only if we delete the primal edge. So we get a pair of um, random percolation configurations, meaning configurations of uh, absent or present edges. And if you then look at um, the loops, what are the loops doing? So here I've drawn in the mirrors with the loops and the corresponding percolation configuration and the loops. And you'll see that in this case, the loops simply surround um, primal or dual percolation clusters. Um, so I'll explain this in a second. Maybe just let me first mention that here it was kind of crucial that um, at each site here where we could place a mirror, we only had two options. It was a mirror, we just wanted to know whether it was northwest or northeast. This doesn't really make sense, this mapping, if if we allow empty sites, because what do we do then? We don't really know what to do. We don't get a useful coupling with, with the percolation model. Okay. But anyway, um, so depending on the parameters, the model you get here is a, is a different uh, percolation model. If n equals 1, <clears throat> This is the case when the mirrors are just independently oriented. That's, this means that the edges are independently sampled. And this is actually just a critical percolation model. Similar idea works um, when n is bigger than 1. You actually get uh, what's known as FK percolation, or the random cluster model. Uh, Q, if you know this notation, is equal to n squared here. The point is that these are... Um, models where there are good tools available, like uh, correlation inequalities. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of nice results on these models. One of those results is that uh, in a percolation configuration like this, at most one of the lattices could have an infinite cluster. And if you then look at, well, suppose one of them actually does have an infinite percolation cluster. For argument's sake, let's say that the primal uh, uh, configuration has an infinite cluster, with positive probability, that is. Um, rather, well, so I mean, what I mean is that if you then look at an edge which uh, separates a uh, white and a black vertex, you know that this will be part of a loop. The question is, I mean, in this picture, the loop surrounds the white, uh, all the white faces. But if this had been the other way around, the loop would have gone like this. 
surrounding a uh, black face. And the, the point is that if we know that we have an infinite cluster of the solid lines, then we, this one belongs to it with positive probability. And with that sort of this extra probability gives a sort of a preference for this loop to go the other way around and to surround the white face instead. Because if this cluster is infinite, cannot be surrounded by a loop. The loop therefore has a preference for surrounding white faces. So that's the sort of uh, uh, the uh, connection to percolation theory and why there are special results on uh, this case, especially good results. So we want to we want to allow um, absent mirrors or empty sites, and we also want to uh, actually sort of. Um, lessen or ease this assumption of symmetry on the mirror weights. So this is what uh, Kieran and I have worked on. So let me first make a slight change of notation or setting. Um, so for us, it is kind of more natural to first rotate the whole picture 45 degrees. So now uh, this chessboard black and white pattern, uh, they're sort of diamond shaped looking because they're rotated compared to before. A uh, couple of changes in notation. Um, instead of the north, east and northwest, we have horizontal and vertical mirrors. And the weights, I, I like to have them between zero and one. Uh, An overall rescaling can accomplish that. That's no loss of generality. Uh, but I want them to be strictly positive as well. Uh, and then this uh, same for this um, P for uh, absent mirrors. We're still on a torus, by the way. So we still have the top is still a copy of the bottom. The left side is still a copy of the right side. And apart from this ro rotation and slight change of notation, everything is the same as before. So let me just repeat it. We draw all the loops. We uh, have a parameter n, which is a number of colors. And each loop receives one out of n colors. And we can look at either the joint configurations of mirrors and colored edges with the same kind of weight as before, the different weights to raise to the power of the number of objects of that each type. But you want the colored edges to be compatible with, uh, with the loop structure. Or you can uh, look at the marginal on the mirror distribution, and you get this n to the number of loops instead. Um, something I didn't point out uh, before is that in, in this picture, n really needs to be an integer if we interpret it as a number of colors. For this formulation, this measure itself uh, makes sense even when n is not an integer. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll mainly focus on the case when n is an integer, whereas in Kieran's talk, uh, n doesn't have to be. So uh, something to uh, look forward to. Um, okay, so then finally, what's our result? Well, basically, we can remove this uh, this assumption and um, just assume that the, the two weights for horizontal and vertical mirrors are uh, strictly positive. Then we get the same conclusion as uh, Chase, Pratik, and Stengel got, essentially. For n large enough, there are two distinct non-translation invariant Gibbs states. So either your picture and a large torus is dominated by these white faces with just a few deviations from that, or the other way around. These are the two typical configurations. So um, we yeah we started working on this a year ago, and it's um, like um, it's taken longer than expected. But one reason for that is, is sort of a good reason. We I mean we had a first proof, and then we have a different proof. So now now we have two proofs uh, of this result. So the first uh, first argument that we had um, only worked um, for a range of parameters. So the density associated with missing mirrors needed to be the smallest of the, the mirror densities. And this proof used or uses a very nice tool called uh, reflection positivity. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, let me just mention the other proof. This, uh, the, the newer proof is sort of clearly gives a stronger result because we don't have this restriction on the mirror weights. We also don't have the restriction on n being an integer. And in this case, we, instead of uh, extending, um, so, so this, this one sort of extends Chase, Pratica, and Stengel, 
This one instead extends the nucleoparin pellets, somatage, and uh, spinca. But this is what Kieran will talk about. So I want to talk about this, even though it's sort of um, slightly more restrictive. It's um, it's, a, it's still a nice argument, and uh, this this reflection positivity is really a nice tool, which arises in a lot of problems in statistical physics. Um, and I think this this model that we're looking at is a nice nice place to hear about reflection positivity if you haven't done so before. So history, well, this reflection positivity was developed or brought into um, statistical physics from theoretical physics in the mid to late 70s by uh, people listed here. There's also an extremely nice review paper by Marek Biskup, which we uh, which we found very useful when working on this. So a few words then about this magical thing, reflection positivity and how we use it. First of all, what is reflection positivity? Well, so theta, this uh, calligraphic theta here, will uh, be the operation of reflecting the torus through a vertical, also works for horizontal, but I'll focus on vertical reflections now, plane through vertices. So I say a vertical plane here, but I've drawn two lines. This is just because we are actually working on a torus. So if you have a torus, like a donut or a bagel, and you cut it in half, you actually have two cuts. So those are the two cuts here that we reflect through. Okay, so we have this reflection plane, theta is the reflection f, uh, is a real valued function of the configuration on the left. So um, configuration here, I mean, now I'm trying to be slightly more general, so you can imagine a configuration uh, of some sort of random assignments to edges or to vertices or to both. F and F is the function of the configuration on the left. Reflection positivity is the condition that, well, first of all, the measure should be invariant under this reflection. So, uh, I mean, if you have a configuration and then you just reflect it across, the distribution is the same. That's the first condition. Uh, but more importantly, or sort of the, the real condition is that for any function of only the configuration on one side, the expectation of that function times this reflection is non-negative. So this is the condition that we need to verify for reflection positivity. So let me just, um, as, as a comment, so or actually before, before the comment, let me state the, the lemma. So our lemma is that, well, if the weight associated with the missing mirrors is the smallest, then we have reflection positivity. But let's be a little bit more precise. It's actually the marginal on edge colorings, which is reflection positive. Okay, so let's flip back to where I had the picture for the model. Here I said, yeah, we can look at joint configurations of mirrors and colored edges. We can look at the marginal on just the mirror configuration. But of course, we could also look at the other marginal. So we could look at the marginal distribution of just the colors um, erasing all the mirrors. And this is the this is the marginal that we sort of really need to look at in order to be rigorous. Notice that, of course, in some places, you can infer what the mirror had to be just because there are different colors on different sides uh, of the vertex. Whereas if you have places where all four edges incoming have the same color, then all possibilities are uh, in principle allowed. You could have had a horizontal, vertical, or no mirror. So there's still randomness left um, in terms of the mirrors. So yeah, so the lemma is saying that we should look at the marginal on edge colorings. Uh, this is reflection positive. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about, uh, about why. So, First of all, just for illustration, imagine, this is really not the case, but imagine that we had a model where we just assigned IID colors to all the edges. So independent uh, colors, one, two, three, up to N, assigned to the edges. This condition is automatic. So I'll, I'll write it like this. If IID edge colors, 
then what is this expectation here? Well, it's just expectation of f squared, which is non-negative. Okay, so IID models are reflection positive. But of course here, I mean, here we know that if there's one color coming in here, that's because there's a loop, uh, which is uh, assigned this color, the loop continues in some direction, so edges are clearly not independent. So this, this uh, very easy argument doesn't work. But, I mean, what you typically do, and what you do in all the examples that I'm aware of, uh, if you want to verify that a model is reflection positive, you take your plane of reflection, you condition on what happens on this plane of reflection, and you say, well, conditional on that, what happens on the left and what happens on the right should be IID, should be independent of each other and have the same distribution. Because if this happens, then you can write sort of, we wanted to look at the expectation of F theta F. We can compute this by first conditioning on the middle and then taking the expectation of that. But now we're saying that these two are, uh, are I mean, the left and the right are ID. So then this will be expected value of F given middle. Let's see here, another expectation given middle, this thing squared because these two things are independent given what happens in the middle and they have the same distribution. You get this nice square and you get something non-negative. So that's what we, what we should uh, check then. And you can notice, well, of the three possibilities, the horse, uh, sorry, vertical mirrors, horizontal mirrors, or absent mirrors, the first two are sort of fine uh, because if you know, if you have a vertical mirror, the constraint that this places on the colors of the edges is symmetric. It's just saying that these two edges have the same color and these two edges have the same color. It's a symmetric constraint for both sides. Same for horizontal mirror. These two have the same color, these two have the same color. But the problematic guy is the absent mirrors because now we're saying that the colors have to go through sort of the same color like this and the same color like that. It's not symmetric with respect to reflecting. So it's an asymmetric constraint. And maybe, so time is going faster than I thought, so maybe I'll be a little bit fast. Just a shout out here to, to Daniel. So he had a really nice idea on, on a paper on uh, quantum spin systems in a sim very similar situation. And his idea was to first sort of decompose into pattern rules to say that, well, I don't want to sample the colors immediately, but I first want to sample sort of configurations of loud colors, and then I sample the colors. And I can, I can define these patterns in such a way that the patterns are symmetrical, and the resulting model once I sort of sample the colors as well uh, is the correct distribution. But it, when you do this, you have to, of course, do the calculation. You get this little difference here which explains why, well, for this to be non-negative, you should really have P uh, sub empty sets smaller than PH. If you also work with reflections the other way, you get the same condition for P empty set being smaller than PV. So that's why we need this uh, weight to be the smallest of them. Right. So. How do we then use reflection positivity? So I want to sort of give an outline of the of the argument, um, sort of proof by pictures. And um, in particular, sort of this consequence of reflection positivity called chessboard estimates. We can use that. So remember what we want to do. We want to uh, say that our picture looks almost always like this or almost always like that. We want to rule out deviations from these two very regular uh, mirror configurations. So a little disclaimer, I'll pretend like it's the mirror model is reflection positive, even though I made a big deal of the fact that it's a particular marginal. But uh, the pictures uh, will be much easier if we pretend that the mirror model uh, is reflection positive. So let's look at a uh, bad event. I haven't drawn the black and white coloring here or the faces, but I mean, if one of them is black, then the other one is white. So this type of configuration is no good if we want to say that the picture is dominated by these or by these. 
So this is a bad local event. This this edge here is not uh, in accordance with what we uh, expect to see. So that's the event B. Now what we do is we consider B together with um, all its possible reflections. So we reflect in all uh, vertical lines and we reflect in all horizontal lines. I mean, B was the event that the two mirrors looked like that. Theta one, if this is sort of the first plane of reflection, is that we have this on this edge. Their intersection is that we have this, uh, this I mean, the parallel mirrors on both edges. And then we keep doing that, reflect, reflect, reflect. We end up with, after doing all the reflections, this very regular pattern where we have all the, all the mirrors are horizontal. So um, yeah, chessboard estimates give a, well, you can see it either as a lower bound for the probability of this configuration or as an upper bound for the probability of the, the small bad configuration. And this is how we're going to use it. So um, the probability of this bad event can be bounded above by this very regular picture. The advantage is that while well, the, the measure that we're working with had this n to the number of loops, so it was sort of um, depending on what happened in the whole configuration, which is, which is hard to do if the only information we have is what's happening on one edge. So it's much easier to estimate the number of loops in this picture. Well, in, in this picture is actually trivial because we know that we'll just have one loop per row. So, and that's the basic idea. Uh, if we reflect this event, we get a very regular pattern where the number of loops, so we have this n to the number of loops, this is growing linearly with the size of the system. Um, whereas there are other configurations, so I, I mean, I've written, written the measure as a quotient of expected values, and in the denominator, we have to take into account that we could have this kind of configuration, where the number of loops is much larger, of order L squared, we get an upper bound on the number of loops. Uh, and this upper bound goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and it's all uniform in L, and that's the important part. So um, I'm looking at the clock and I realize time is going faster than I thought. So maybe I'll um, not say more about this particular argument. There's a piles argument. But let me instead um, talk about continuous loop models. So one of the things I emphasized earlier was that we could deal with, I mean, so the, the earlier results, Chase, Pratik, and Stengel, they required... Um, the weights for northeast and northwest mirrors to be the same. And one of our motivations was to sort of say that we don't really need this assumption, to remove that assumption. And the reason for, for doing this is that this gives us access to type of continuous loop model, which I'm going to describe to you now. To obtain this continuous loop model, we do like a vertical scaling limit. So we rescale vertical distances by epsilon. So the distance between uh, two, um, oh yeah, and also instead of coloring the faces black and white, I decided to color vertices black and white in every other column, it contains the same information. Uh, vertical distances are rescaled by epsilon. Epsilon is gonna go to zero, of course. Uh, and as epsilon goes to zero, we let the different weights associated with the mirrors depend on epsilon. Two of them will be proportional to epsilon. So I just introduce a parameter u here, which gives the proportionality of uh, missing mirrors, the density of missing mirrors. Uh, one minus u, I'll give that, call that the, the density for uh, horizontal mirrors, these guys. And at the same time, um, the density for vertical mirrors will converge to one. Here I sort of uh, pointed out, well, maybe before, uh, before that, clearly, um, so, the, so this constraint here, northeast and northwest being of the same weight, would have translated into these two, uh, sorry, uh, these two being the same. But clearly, in order to do this scaling limit, 
we can't have them being the same because one of them should converge to one, one of them should converge to zero. So that's why it was important to remove that restriction. Okay, uh, here I also pointed out, well, this previous assumption that we had for reflection positivity translates to this new parameter being less than one half. But um, let's look at what happens with loops in this new picture. Well, since these uh, vertical mirrors have a density very high, we'll mostly see long corridors of vertical mirrors, and the loop is just bouncing back and forth, traveling vertically in between them, until occasionally we encounter a missing mirror, in which case the loop crosses over and continues in the same direction, or a horizontal mirror, it crosses over, changes direction. Now, the number of vertices here is of order one over epsilon, uh, and these densities are proportional to epsilon, so as epsilon goes to zero, there will be sort of a constant uh, proportion, or I mean, there's a constant intensity for the number of uh, these missing mirrors or horizontal mirrors. And we get a well-defined scaling limit. Um, before taking that, maybe let's also say that, well, this left to right motion is not really important. The important thing is that we're traveling vertically until we encounter a missing mirror or a horizontal mirror. And as epsilon goes to zero, the important thing then to keep track of is where do we have missing mirrors and where do we have horizontal mirrors? And we can represent this in a picture like this. So these are the sort of, after taking the limit epsilon goes to zero, the remnants of the, the white columns, remnants of the black columns. Remember we had white and black now in this new coloring convention. And we just keep track of on both these lines, where do we have missing mirrors? They get the rate U. And where do we have horizontal mirrors? We represent them as double bars with a rate one minus u. And the basic, the underlying process here will be Poisson processes. But then we play the same game as before. We draw the loops. We say that the loops can have uh, up to n colors. And uh, this defines our uh, random loop, con loop configurations. So, um, these uh, loop models, they originate, I mean, it's not just a, a fun game to take the scaling limit. These models have a, a long history and they originate in quantum spin systems. And actually that's why we were interested in these continuous loop models. So Balintot uh, considered the case when you only have uh, crosses. This is related to what's known as the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Eisenberg, uh, Eisenman and Achtegelder, they considered a, um, an antiferromagnetic model where you only have these double bars. And then uh, Daniel Ilchi uh, considered the spin system where you have a combination of both. And uh, yeah, got information about that spin system through the, the random loops. And that's basically what, what we do as well here. So I mentioned uh, an earlier result of the case u equals zero. So that means no missing mirrors or none of these little crosses. They're not allowed. Uh, and then for n bigger than two, they proved that the loop model has two non-translation invariant Gibbs states illustrated here. The loops either surround the white columns or they surround the black columns. Those are the two, uh, two typical configurations. And uh, our result then is, well, so far, Definitely, if you use less than or equal to one half, then we can again apply reflection positivity and get the same result provided that n is large enough. Uh, n here is an integer, uh, as I said, u is less than or equal to one half, and we're work in progress. Um, we're pretty confident that we will be able to extend it to all u less than one, meaning uh, as, as soon as you have a little bit of these double bars, that's one minus u, the same result should hold and also for non-integer n. Um, right, so the third part of the talk, I don't really have time to do. I wanted to explain the connection to quantum spin systems. So maybe I'll just flick through right to the end where I sort of have a, at least a Hamiltonian and um, sort of a, a little bit of context. So what we've been looking at 
through a probabilistic lens is actually a quantum spin chain. The general form of the quantum spin chain can be written like this. You have a parameter u, we we'll recognize that letter. There's also another parameter v. Um, this, um, this is sort of, uh, yeah, for different choices of u and v, we get models with kind of radically different behaviors. The case that we have been looking at is this quadrant. So this is the probabilistic quadrant when both u and v are positive. And in this entire quadrant, sort of the expectation is this dimerization. That's the that's the statistical physics term for what I've described with these two non-translation invariant Gibbs states. And then sort of this point A, that's the work of Eisenman, Dominic, Kupan, and Valtzel. The darker yellow is the stuff that we've uh, certainly uh, proved so far uh, up to this point here, but also um, together with uh, Mühlbacher, Nachtigall, and Ulchi, a little bit of negative intensity we could handle. So there's a non-probabilistic case we could do. Um, and then, as I said, we're confident that we'll soon be able to, to fill the, the rest of this quadrant. Um, uh, yes. So, so that's all. Thank you very much for listening.